A history in two layers, double knitting from 1800 to the present. First, an introduction. I'm Alistair Post Quinn, double knitting designer, teacher, and author of Extreme Double Knitting, Double or Nothing, Parallax, and a handful of other patterns. I want to talk a little bit about the history of double knitting and my place in it. Let me preface this by saying that I am an artist, not an historian. I've collected a wealth of information on double knitting and made significant contributions to its development in modern times, but I am going to take the scarce documentation I can find and do my best to paint a complete picture. As with any artwork, liberties may be taken and connections may be guessed at where we cannot see the actual structure of a thing, and in the end I hope we will have an approximation of reality. We tend to think of double knitting as a relatively new form of knitting. Perhaps that is true in its current form. But let's take a quick detour and review what double knitting is. Double knitting is a method of making a fabric with no wrong side. At its most basic, both layers look like stockinette, and in most cases we'll have a colorwork motif. On the other side of the work, the motif is reversed in color and orientation, as you can see here in this example of my Corvus pattern, one of my earliest double knit designs. This is of course just at the basic level. My mission over the past decade and a half has been to push the outer limits of the technique and translate as many single layer techniques as possible to double knitting. So here are the rules of double knitting. The basic rules of double knitting dictate the underlying structure of the fabric. And those are that every stitch is part of a pair, and that every pair has a color order and a stitch order. Those are the orders in which the stitches and the colors are put on the needle. The rules of standard double knitting are applied to make the most common fabric, which looks like stockinette on both layers, and which I call, predictably, double stockinette. The third rule is that the stitch order will be knit purl. And the fourth is that the color order may be AB or BA, but must always be one of each color. The final rule applies to modern double knitting as opposed to the slip stitch method, and is added to explain how the fabric is created. Whenever a stitch is made, both yarns must be held together, but only one worked. So let's return to history. Probably the earliest mention of double knitting occurs in Leo Tolstoy's masterpiece, War and Peace, written in 1869, but written about the year 1805. If we take it as given that Tolstoy's story is at least historically plausible, then double knitting existed in some form in the early 1800s. The mention in this book is brief, a mere aside. Two stockings, which, by a secret process known only to herself, Anna Makarovna used to knit at the same time on the same needles, and which, when they were ready, she always triumphantly drew one out of the other in the children's presence. The passage implies that the process may have been in use, if not heavy use, in the year 1805 at least. Some further research corroborates this. One of the earliest published knitting books, Die Kunst zu Stricken, or The Art of Knitting, published in 1800 in Germany by Johann Friedrich Netto, there is a description of this sock within a sock trick. I do not read German, so I am going on the word of a blogger who claims that the method used in this text uses a form of double knitting wherein the socks are worked with their purl sides out. So, another detour. I've been thinking a lot recently about how knitting is constructed, and I've come to a realization. Knitting, as you know, is made up of two stitches a knit and a purl. We think of the two as separate stitches, but they're really the same thing in reverse from each other. This is not news to most knitters. However, did you ever think about why we hold our yarn at the back to knit and at the front to purl? It's because the place where the yarn lies forms the purl bumps. It would be more accurate to say that we are purling. Knits are just a convenient side effect of doing purls on the back side of our work. In modern double knitting, the yarns travel together because we want to draw purls on the back of the front layer and on the front of the back layer so that the purls end up hidden and we see knits on the outside, on both outside layers of the work. 
However, the risk of doing this is that the two yarns can easily become twisted and cause the layers to become permanently linked together. If one was to use this method for the sock within a sock trick, the tiniest mistake would cause the entire thing to fail. Yet, according to Kate Atherley, who teaches a class on this method, this is the method by which it was done in the Tolstoy era. In Principles of Knitting, long considered the authority on a wide variety of knitting techniques, this is also the method described. In the 2006 Knitty article by Corey Stamper, this is still the method described. However, the earliest description of the actual method I can find is in a patent from 1874, which clearly indicates that the two layers should be worked purl side out. If you want this effect, you draw pearls on the front of the front layer and the back of the back layer by leaving the two ends on the outside of the work, as you can see in this photo. And I do apologize for the photo. As you can see, the knitting in the photo is still knit side out, but you can see the technique for making it purl side out. So you just have to imagine that there are pearls on the outside, as you would imagine for purl side out. So in this way, the yarns are never next to each other. They can't twist, the two layers remain separate easily. However, this does not mean that prior to 1874 the knit side out method was not already in use. The patent may very well have been essentially an improvement over prior methods, although this is not explicitly stated in the patent's text. Here's where things get kind of murky. Beyond that 1874 patent, I have found very little that explicitly relates to double knitting, especially the eventual development of two-color motif double knitting, which is largely what people who double knit do today. So my research will continue, but for now we'll just have to jump forward in time precisely 100 years to 1974. Somewhere in the intervening time, the two ends at once methods described in the 1874 patent and earlier documents had apparently fallen out of favor. In their place was another style, called slip-stitch double knitting, which may well have been older than the other method, or may have been developed either as a way of simplifying the technique, or as a direct descendant of tubular double knitting, which uses the same technique with a single color. However it appeared, this method of double knitting was the favored method until the early 1980s. As a matter of fact, it was from a book that featured this style that I got my start. Jane Neighbor's reversible two-color knitting does not even mention the term double knitting, at least in its 1974 edition. My original copy was lost in a flood, and my second copy was lost in a fire, but I believe that the 1982 reprint that I have seen may have been revised and expanded, as I couldn't find some of the things I remember learning from it when I found it in a library once upon a time. But the method described therein is absolutely the slip-stitch method I originally learned. By 1981, when Beverly Royce came out with her seminal work, Notes on Double Knitting, the modern method was already gaining a foothold. And by the time her expanded edition came out in 1994, it had well and truly replaced the slip-stitch method for most designers. Notes on Double Knitting dealt mostly with tubular single-color double knitting, but it did address a more complete solution to the War and Peace socks, including toe and heel, using the knit side out. But holding the two yarns in opposite hands to keep them from twisting. There was also, and this info is from the expanded edition, I have not gotten my hands on an original yet, a slight nod at the very end to reversible color work, but still using the slip stitch method. In the winter 1989 issue of Knitter's Magazine, there was a baby blanket called Pachyderm Parade by Wendy Keel. The article didn't present the modern method as a new and groundbreaking thing, so I'm assuming that this colorwork method was already known to some degree at this point. However, Beverly Royce and I appear to agree that this was the first mass market appearance of modern double knitting. From there, a host of new double knitters was born. An older modern double knitting pattern was recently brought to my attention, published in a somewhat obscure magazine called The Prairie Wool Companion, created by the Zinakis family before the founding of Knitter's Magazine, which largely dealt with weaving, but deviated into other crafts as well. This pattern was initially presented as a weaving chart by Lynn Vershoor, but was adapted by Elaine Rowley not only to a knitting pattern, but to a double-knitted garment. The accompanying article does present the slip-stitch method initially, but then goes through a thorough explanation and tutorial for the modern method, which leads me to believe that in 1982, the modern method was still novel to most people. 
It may not be coincidence that Malou Baber's bio indicates that she discovered double knitting in 1990, only a couple months after that Knitter's Magazine issue came out. Malou, as one of Meg Swanson's knitting camp people, was responsible for spreading the technique further, and came out with a book of her own in 2008. A bit of trivia. I was asked to copy edit this book originally, but since I was already working on a book of my own, I could not easily separate my own research and opinions from her work and had to turn down the job. Lucy Neatby, one of the people many knitters think about first when talking about double knitting, put out her first double knitting pattern in 2003, a simple checkerboard scarf called Mirror Mirror. Since then, she has been expanding the capabilities and refining the techniques of double knitting probably more than anyone else, except perhaps myself. At this point, the presentation may seem to take a bit of a turn into shameless self-promotion, but I am simply continuing the timeline I've been building and getting more granular as I talk about my own contributions to the art and craft of double knitting. After all, who knows more about my own work than me? A little history of my involvement in the knitting world. I grew up in Vermont. My mother and grandmother knitted regularly, and I fondly remember the smell of rustic yarn from Bartlett and the like. However, I did not learn to knit until my senior year of college, in 2003. In 2005, I discovered double knitting in the appendix of Jane Neighbor's book, and in 2006, I released my first pattern, the Corvus Scarf, for free download on my website. This was prior to Ravelry, or at least prior to my involvement in Ravelry. From there, I began to research techniques and realized that very little documentation, very few books or patterns, and very little online existed for double knitting, and most of what there was focused on the slip stitch method. So as I began to see possibilities, I began to test things out and design new patterns for them. In the following three years, I taught workshops around the northeastern US and developed techniques for two pattern double knitting, three color double knitting, rudimentary double knit cables, lace, and textures, as well as refining existing techniques for double knit increases and decreases. I'll talk more about the development process soon. It was actually a piece using these increases and decreases, adapted from a pattern by Kieran Foley, that first caught the imagination of Shannon Oakey at Cooperative Press, who was visiting my local guild, the Common Cod Fiber Guild, now sadly defunct, as a presenter on the challenges of indie publishing and ended up offering me my first book contract. I had already been thinking about writing a book, so this helped me solidify my plans. In 2010, I attended the first and only Men's Visionary Authors Retreat with Kat Bordy, which bolstered my confidence and set me on a solid path to completion of the book Extreme Double Knitting. I and many of the other men in this photo, some of whom you will certainly recognize, not to mention a significant portion of the well-known designers and teachers active today, owe a great deal to Kat. In October of 2011, Cooperative Press released my first book, Extreme Double Knitting, to an enthusiastic reception at Rhinebeck and a somewhat more skeptical reception at Stitches East the following weekend. After that, I went from a no-name designer to a teacher in demand at big shows around the country. Craftsy and Interweave were the first to pick me up in 2012, then Stitches in 2015, and Vogue in 2016. I had been working on some patterns that used and expanded on techniques I had covered in my first book, and these also became quite popular. In 2014, I returned to a visionary author's retreat to pitch a new book, properly self-published this time, called Double or Nothing. I envisioned a book that covered the content in extreme double knitting, expanding it where necessary in a couple of chapters, then jumped off the deep end into new developments I'd been focusing on in between books. That book came out in late 2016 and includes patterns using double knit textures, double knit intarsia, double knit cables, double knit lace, and double knit entrelock, among others. As I finished up with Double or Nothing, I got a message from Cooperative Press that they were looking to streamline their catalog and were giving authors the option to renegotiate contracts, with one option being not to do so and reclaim all rights to their published work. This came a little sooner than I had expected, but it had been on my agenda, so I accepted. My original 2011 version of Extreme Double Knitting went out of print for a little while as Cooperative Press ran out of stock while I was still working on the new revised edition. The new edition cleaned up some of the inconsistencies between my understanding of double knitting from a decade ago and my current understanding. 
I updated the terminology and charts to be consistent with Double or Nothing and relayed it out in oblong format so they'd fit nicely together on a shelf. I also made significant changes and improvements to some of my most well-known patterns. I had decided that if I was going to self-publish the book, it would be better to truly make it my own rather than just slapping a new ISBN on it and printing the old version. It took almost as long to finish this as Double or Nothing had to write from start to finish, but I feel it was still worth it. So now I'm going to talk about some of my developments in modern double knitting and how they came to be. This is only a sampling of my work, but for more examples and for patterns for any of these, please visit my website at double-knitting.com. As we go through these next slides, let me clarify that to the best of my knowledge at the time when I was developing these techniques, there was no prior documentation for most of them. This is not to say that I was definitely the first to try these techniques, simply that I appear to have been the first to write them down. The only exception is the very first one. Two pattern double knitting was actually something that had been figured out and documented in a number of places, although the application of it was much simpler. For example, vertical stripes on one layer and horizontal on the other, or simple shapes worked over a small swatch. In some cases, the designer did not even consider it double knitting, even though that was absolutely what it was. The chart notation, if there was any, was different for every person, and frankly, mine was no exception. I found other people's two-pattern double knitting notation cumbersome and confusing, so I worked out my own that I found easier to work from and to explain. The general idea behind this concept is that you need not be limited to a single pattern. You can, within certain limitations, work up a double knit fabric that has two very different patterns on either side. I discovered this at a workshop I was teaching where one of my students managed to create a pair where both stitches were the same color. While this is against the rules of standard double knitting, it's certainly not impossible, and it does open up some intriguing possibilities. In this example, called Open for Business, from my original book Extreme Double Knitting, the opposite layer does not read Nebo in reversed letters, as you might expect, but instead reads Closed. Box of Delights version 2 is the revised version of the original Box of Delights pattern from the 2011 edition, which was not a two-pattern piece originally. With the revision, I reworked this seamless lidded box pattern so that the inside layer was entirely worked in a solid color. So technically two-pattern, but a very different application of the technique. Multicolor double knitting here shown with three colors in the revised edition of the structure hat, is actually a close relative of two-pattern double knitting. When working a pair in fewer colors than the number of yarns you have, something has to happen to the unused yarn or yarns. And in either two-pattern or multicolor double knitting, the unused yarns are stranded inside the work. In standard three-color double knitting, the pattern needs to hold to a color rotation rather than a simple binary switch from A to B. This is, for any of my patterns anyway, worked out for you in the chart's key. Since the two techniques are related, it would be an obvious next step to try combining them. I had already done so in the Falling Blocks hat, released in 2010 before my first book even came out, but I'd rather show this magnum opus, a logical extreme of two-pattern, three-color double knitting called 52 Pickup. In this scarf, every card is charted separately and has both a front and a back. So every visible front in this scarf has a card back on the other layer, and vice versa. There are actually 54 cards, I added two jokers, to make it divisible by three. World Tree version 2, the revised edition of the original 2011 pattern, is a four-color, two-pattern, seamless, self-lining shoulder bag. Similar to the Box of Delights, the second pattern is simply a solid color. Only two of the four colors are used in every row in this chart, and one of them is already the background of the front layer, so, at least in my sample, the inner color is a sky blue. I wanted to include one of the Parallax series, as I worked on them in between books and they've become among my most popular patterns. Parallax version 2.0 is an adaptation of the Metapixel style of double knitting, which uses increases and decreases to send the fabric on the bias. As an aside, Metapixel double knitting doesn't have anything actually to do with the increases and decreases, but it's an intriguing design concept which I have coined a term for, which is based on existing design concepts used in 1960s and 70s op art, as well as overshot weaving. I have a live stream about Metapixel double knitting on my Facebook page, you should go check it out. Increases and decreases, mostly decreases to be honest, were already in use in my work for shaping, especially hat crowns. 
but what I really wanted to do with them was a little different. Victorian raffia is a prime example of what I call off-the-grid double knitting, so named because the chart looks visibly different from the actual knitting due to the difficulty of expressing all this diagonal movement in a grid. This pattern is a joint venture by me and Kieran Foley, who I share the sales proceeds with. Vasily was my first foray into double knit cables. I originally postulated that, since double knitting was worked in a similar way to one by one ribbing, knit one, purl one, etc., the techniques that used one by one ribbing to create reversible cables might also work for double knitting. Indeed, they did, but the limitation of that technique, both in ribbing and double knitting, is that those cables cannot remain reversible and travel along a negative background. While I was developing the techniques for the original edition of Extreme Double Knitting, I could not find an elegant solution for traveling cables, so I assumed that there was none. Predictably, I was wrong, but I'll get to that later. Double knitting can be combined easily with marled knitting, which I had a different name for in Extreme Double Knitting's original edition, but which I used in a couple of patterns there and refined somewhat in this roughly keyhole scarf. Marling is simply another way to process a pair of stitches, working both stitches together with both yarns held together, rather than working each stitch separately with each yarn individually. This means that the two techniques can be combined in the same pattern in all kinds of different ways. In rustle of leaves, all of the short row shaping happens outside the double knitting, within the marling, so this is still a good pattern for beginning double knitters. While marling adds texture, it's not actually double knitting per se. Fully textured double knitting was a technique I had played with, but eventually relegated to the appendix of extreme double knitting, thinking that there was little practical application for it. Boy, was I wrong. Once I started playing with it in earnest, I found that addition of pearl textures to the outside layers of my work opened up all kinds of new possibilities. Lucy Neatby has also been playing with these techniques for quite some time and has a number of patterns that use knit and pearl textures. Returning to double knit cables, Extreme Double Knitting came out in October of 2011. In it, I opined that there was no practical, elegant solution for true traveling double knit cables. As luck or fate would have it, I discovered not only one, but two ways to do it in January of 2012, only a few months later. I am not the only person who has experimented with double knit cables, but the handful of other people who have designed with them typically use two cable needles or rely on the technique I was trying to avoid, which is separating the layers cabling them individually, and then reintegrating them, which I feel diverges from double knitting quite a bit. The methods I developed use either one cable needle or none at all. This necktie has the classic double stripe in the American or European fashion, depending on which layer you have facing out, but these stripes are all one by one traveling cables against a knit background. The name of the tie is twice as sexy because the yarn's name is sexy. Cables against a pearl background are a little closer to what people expect, and Heartbound again combines textured double knitting with the cabling technique. In fact, this entire hat, with the exception of some fiddly bits near the crown, is entirely done without a cable needle. Adenith means wings in Welsh, and this seven and a half foot wide double knit lace fairies shawl is a true magnum opus in double knitting. Lace was actually something I played with in the appendix of extreme double knitting, and only began revisiting when I saw a couple of other people testing the waters of double knit lace design on Ravelry. Double knitting lace is really the only practical way to add color to lace freely, as intarsia takes too much planning and stranded color work can't be done cleanly when yarn overs show every strand that would otherwise be hidden. Double knitting allows me to pick out and emphasize elements of lace patterns by changing their color with few limitations. The yarn overs themselves are simple, and I have five different ways to do them depending on the results you want. The challenge is making sure you know how to do all the decreases and other interesting moves so often found in lace knitting, also in double knitting. One of the reasons I look for techniques to adapt to double knitting is if the technique has a wrong side that I consider unattractive. The prime example of that would probably be intarsia. The development of double knit intarsia hit a roadblock as I was trying to figure out how to keep the layers separate at the intarsia color changes while still leaving them linked together at the double knit ones. It turned out that this was unnecessary and I was able to climb over the roadblock once I realized that it was actually better to have the fabric linked together at both types of color change. The continuum hat is actually double knit intarsia in the round, because I had room and time for only one double knit intarsia pattern in Double or Nothing, and I figured I'd tackle all the techniques at once. 
I've adapted Anne Burke's Anne Tarsha method to double knitting for this one. Also in the category of less than attractive wrong sides would be entrelock. Double knit entrelock gave me an excuse to work out all kinds of techniques in double knitting. Short rows, picking up stitches along edges, double knitting backward, and a few other little tricks. In the end, this hat is supported by an entire chapter of techniques that bend the rules of double knitting and use elements of the fabric in unexpected ways. It turns out that double knitting and entrelock go together startlingly well. Since I had to tackle the revision of extreme double knitting shortly after finishing with Double or Nothing, I had little time to consider expanding on those techniques. However, now that both are done, I'm bringing some of my backburner projects to the forefront. The first to be released was the Agnu Deus hat, the first from my Wu Xing Five Elements collection. This is the fire element, and it uses off-the-grid double knitting with beads. This will be the second in the same series. Honey Locust is the earth element and uses textured double knitting, off-the-grid double knitting, and some subtle lace elements. It should have been out by now, and with COVID I've had more time to get patterns together, but life is not always kind. At the end of May, my home and studio burnt down. Since then, we've been scrambling to rebuild a semblance of our old life, and I'd like to thank those of you who have helped with that, either by helping with housing, transportation, furniture, buying my patterns, contributing to the GoFundMe my coworkers set up for us, or even just holding us in the light, as my Quaker community would say. While it will take us quite a while to rebuild, we are comfortable for now, and my work will continue. The development of double knitting is not done. I'm still working, and I am sure there are others pushing the boundaries in other directions. Stuff I'm working on right now includes tuck stitches. I came up with a neat way to do this recently, but lost the notes and the samples in the fire. Stacked stitches, which you've probably seen associated with Zandy Peters' fox paws pattern and others, are another possibility, mostly as a challenge. I want to finally do some deeper dives into the techniques I developed in Double or Nothing, and I've also figured out a new knitted Mobius construction, one I don't think I have ever seen anyone else use in knitting. We'll see what else I come up with that I might not have even imagined so far. And if you want to see it, and especially if you want to get in on my increasingly popular Zoom workshops, you should hop on my mailing list. Thank you for your attention, and stay tuned for more fun stuff here in this channel. Visit my website, my blog, other social media stuff. If you get nothing else from this slide, visit double-knitting.com. Everything else is linked from there. Thank you. This has been Alistair Post Quinn from Falling Blocks Designs.